51-year-old lady presented with epigastric pain for six months. OGD in 2015 shows unremarkable study. Ultrasound in 2015 shows gallstones. However, PET CT in November this year showing a mass is the celiac takeoff, which is two cystic lesions, 3.1 and 3.5 cm at the pancreatic body. Tissue between two cysts shows increased tracer uptake with SUV max 6 extends into the ritual parenchyatic space and also encasing the celiac artery. This is a CT scan. So today we're going to do EUS plus FNA plus or minus celiac plexus neurolysis. So uh, as you heard, uh, we have a, a solid and cystic tumor which appears to be uh, involving the celiac and uh, uh, we see the exact same findings on the endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, that's quite common now with very high quality CT scans that the, the staging information, I think we're getting a very good staging information from the CT. The main role of the EUS here is for tissue diagnosis. So here we have the descending aorta. The feet are to the left and the head is to the right. Uh, and here is the celiac artery coming off here. And the second vessel coming uh, below it is the superior mesenteric artery. We see the celiac artery enter this dark tumor here. And in fact, you can see there's both a solid and this black portion here is a cystic. And the celiac artery is in fact completely encased. Here's the celiac artery entering into the tumor. And you can see the tumor on all sides of the celiac. We also have a slight involvement uh, of the superior mesenteric artery here. You have the tumor uh, here. And here's the superior mesenteric artery. There's just a slight boundary here. And then actually this is the superior mesenteric vein right here. And this also appears to be involved with the tumor. So our first goal here is to do a, a, uh, a tissue diagnosis. We've actually done one pass already. And I'll go ahead and prepare for the second pass. We're using the uh, Cook 25-gauge uh, needle. I told you in our first lecture two days ago that the 25-gauge needle uh, seems to provide the best overall sample. I do want to carefully avoid the cystic component here just because of the slight risk of infection. So I'm going to rotate the echo endoscope to avoid the cystic component. We also are using the Doppler to avoid the vessels. And you can see the needle entering the field of view uh, in the upper right corner. So here's the needle, and we simply puncture forward. I'm going to turn the Doppler off, and I'm going to go ahead and pull the stylet out completely and apply suction. So I, I told you in my lecture two days ago that suction is not always necessary. Uh, we did the first pass already, and we got uh, a small amount of tissue and fluid. Uh, it was non-bloody. Uh, so since it was such a small amount, I want to use more suction to increase our tissue yield. So we're puncturing forward with the needle. Mm -hmm. And we're, you can see with my left hand, I'm moving the large dial up and down, and also the, uh, the elevator up and down. And I want to be careful to uh, uh, stay away from that cystic portion. Yes. And we do about 20 times back and forth, uh, typically over about 15 to 30 seconds. You're applying uh, suction at the moment, are you, Mike? That's correct. We've applied suction here, about 10 cc's of negative suction. And that's because on the first pass, we got uh, only a small volume. So now I'm going to turn the suction off. We pull the needle back, and we lock the needle up for safety. We'll go ahead and we've, uh, Raymond's already prepared some slides here. And I'll let Raymond show, uh, we'll go ahead and just uh, make a couple of slides. We'll focus in on this area here. Mike, uh, could you guess what the tumor might be? It's unusual. Well, it looks, uh, there's a cystic component for sure. So uh, I suspect that this is a malignant degeneration of a, uh, a cystic tumor. Uh, in a female, uh, in the tail, it's most likely a mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma. Um, it could also be an IPMN. What is the size of the tumor based on? Uh, so let me, I didn't measure it already. We can do that right now. Uh, it looks to be maybe three centimeters. Mm. Uh, the fact that it encases uh, around the major vessels. So 3.3 centimeters there. Yeah. But unfortunately, um, it, it is involving the artery, yeah. so I don't think this is currently resectable. So which means uh, the patient probably have a lot of pain, isn't it? 
Um, yes, and actually another interesting finding that we've often seen, if you look at the region of the celiac plexus, we actually can see this dark tissue right here. This is actually the celiac ganglion, mm. and we often see this in patients with malignant infiltration of the celiac ganglion. Uh, this is neural tissue right here. If we biopsy that, we would get neural tissue with likely tumor invasion directly into the nerve. So I think this tumor is actually invading right up the neural sheath uh, and into the celiac ganglion. Uh, our target, uh, we'll do this uh, after we finish the FNA, but we will uh, target our celiac plexus neurolysis right to this region. So we've actually gotten a nice core of tissue. Uh, uh, I think quite impressive. If you can hold the scope for me for a second, what we're going to do is I'm going to pick up this core of tissue and we're going to place that in formalin. So we have actually a nice, uh, there's a little bit of a blood clot and we'll s smear it around here to get a cytological sample, but I'm going to put that bulky tissue into the formalin uh, and we'll get histology. The rest of this will make some thin smears and if we had on-site cytology, we could do an immediate uh, modified Romanowski stain or a Diffquick stain and assess our adequacy. Since we don't have on-site cytology, I'm going to do a, a probably four to five passes just to be sure we have enough. Okay, Mike, we the fact move that we're seeing to, uh, bulk tissue room, is, we'll uh, is suggestive that we're going to have an we adequate have. specimen. Hi, Mike, we're back. Good, so we've just finished our fourth pass. Uh, each time we got a good amount of tissue, so I, I'm uh, reasonably confident that we're going to have an adequate a specimen. So we're going to go ahead and prepare now for the celiac neurolysis. So the anatomy here, again, the celiac ganglion starts just above the takeoff of the celiac artery and it extends down along uh, the anterior uh, surface of the aorta down to the superior mesenteric artery. Traditionally, uh, we have injected in this region just above the celiac uh, uh, artery takeoff. Uh, two methods have been described. One is a, a single midline injection, uh, and the second is two uh, bilateral injections. Uh, one randomized trial from Anand Sahai in Montreal showed that the bilateral injection was slightly superior. So that's our preferred method. We've prepared a 19-gauge needle. This is the 19-gauge uh, needle from Boston Scientific. We've already taken the stylet out, and we've flushed the needle with saline. Uh, so uh, the steps I'll walk you through as, uh, as we do each step. So we attach the needle here, and our target here, first of all, it will be this region right here. Uh, you can also directly inject the ganglion. Uh, Mike Levy at the Mayo Clinic has done several studies with that. Uh, we're still in the middle of a prospective randomized trial of direct ganglion injection uh, or celiac plexus injection. Um, I want to be a little bit careful because the diaphragm is right here. Now uh, this is the lower crust of the diaphragm and I don't want to uh, inject into the diaphragm. So again, my target is right here at the base of the celiac artery. So we're going to bring the needle forward. You can see the needle here. We're going to aim uh, a little bit lower, puncture through the wall. And in order to make sure this is a safe procedure, the first thing we do is flush with saline. So go ahead and flush about uh, two cc's of saline. And we look for the fluid to enter at the correct, and you can see a little bit of fluid. Now aspirate for 10 seconds. The purpose of this is first the saline clears the tissue out of the end of the needle. And now we're aspirating to make sure we're not in an artery. It would be catastrophic to inject ethanol directly into the celiac artery. So we take extra precautions. We do a 10-second aspiration, so that's about 10 seconds. Go ahead and remove the saline syringe and first attach the bupivacaine. So we're going to inject uh, uh, three cc's of bupivacaine. Uh, also mar uh, called Marcan. So this is zero. Uh, go ahead and inject three cc's. We're using a 19 gauge needle here because the larger diameter, and go ahead and uh, remove that syringe and attach the ethanol. So we're going to inject a 10 cc's of absolute 95% uh, uh, ethanol. Okay, that's 3 cc's total of the bupivacaine. 
Okay, go ahead and remove that syringe. Is there a We're maximum our amount of how much you could inject in one go usually? Yes, uh, you can actually inject more than that. It tends to diffuse through the retroperitoneal space. So with the 19 gauge needle, there's not much resistance. So you'll see a cloud appear. Uh, yes, go ahead and, and we will lose, uh, lose our, our US view. Go ahead and inject the ethanol now. Uh, ethanol is very echogenic, so you'll see in just a moment that we're losing, uh, losing our field of view. And you can see a little bit of fluid uh, uh, developing at the tip of the needle. So it's actually immediately in the vicinity uh, of the celiac ganglion. Uh, there's an interesting observation from Shyam Veradarajulu that if uh, uh, a, a rapid rise in the pulse rate at this point uh, indicates a good injection. Uh, and a good response. So I'm actually watching the heart rate monitor. So far, I'm not seeing a, r a rise in the pulse rate. So that's 10 cc's. OK. Uh, we'll finish the 10 cc's here. And then we'll pull the needle back and go on the other side of the aorta and do this. We'll repeat the same steps. Let's actually go ahead and flush with saline, uh, 2 cc's, which is about the dead space of the needle. So Dr. Wallace, uh, there are some studies suggesting that uh, early CPN or CGN is better than um, waiting for patients CCs. to develop pain. Um, is yeah, that actually, um, your experience too at Mayo? Yeah, actually if you look historically at uh, celiac plexus neurolysis, go ahead and, uh, and, uh, uh, go ahead and uh, actually we don't need to aspirate, you can just leave the, uh, the syringe there. I'm gonna pull the needle back. In fact, one of the very first trials uh, was a surgical trial by Keith Lillimo at the uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University. And at the time of uh, surgical exploration, he, uh, if the patient was unresectable, he randomized them to a sham injection of saline uh, or an actual neurolysis. Uh, he showed two interesting things. One, uh, first of all, there was a, a good treatment response. And your point uh, is exactly correct that even patients who did not have pain at baseline uh, had prevention of pain at a later date um, compared to the sham injection. A third interesting observation is there was actually a statistically significant survival benefit um, uh, with the procedure. We don't know if that was just uh, 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 fortunate uh, or if the improved pain control somehow resulted in uh, better outcomes, but there was a survival benefit with celiac neurolysis. Thank so you very I'm just preparing much, uh, now for the uh, injection on the other side. Uh, I'm going to rotate a little counterclockwise here. Uh, so we go just off the axis of the aorta. We bring the needle again into the field of view. I'm going to check my Doppler. And I want a little more angle. Okay, so that looks good there. I'm going to turn my Doppler off. Mike, thank you for the demonstration. Good. 